How's it going everyone? In this video I'm going to go through the common infections that are encountered and the antibiotics that are indicated in them. This is something that's often and easily forgotten but it's really important. Most of the recommendations are taken from the NICE guidelines. A quick disclaimer first though, I got the main mnemonic I'm about to show you from Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's video on antibiotic classifications so I will leave a link to that video as well. I've added to this mnemonic the common infections that are encountered in order just to put it all together in one place. We'll go through the mnemonic first, then go through the infections. So the original mnemonic for the antibiotic classes is antibiotics can protect the queen's men, servants and guards. This stands for aminoglycosides, cephalosporins, penicillin, tetracycline, quinolones, macrolides, sulfonamides and glycopeptides but I'm also going to add a second class of antibiotics under C, the carbapenems. Now what I'm going to do is run through examples of each antibiotic as well as their general mechanism of action and side effects. Then I'll list the most common infections by body system and put which antibiotics are most commonly used. First we have aminoglycosides. Examples include streptomycin and gentamicin and this class of antibiotics mostly works by inhibiting protein synthesis. It does this by binding to the 30S subunit of bacterial ribosomes. They don't affect protein synthesis in humans because we don't have 30S and 50S subunits like bacteria. We have 40S and 60S. Aminoglycosides cover gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria but they do not work on anaerobes. The main side effects include nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity which occur in between 10 and 20% of patients. General indications include UTIs, endocarditis, topical skin infections and pneumonia. Next we have the cephalosporins. These work by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. You may already know that there are several generations of cephalosporins. In fact, there are five. First generation are quite narrow spectrum and include cefazolin while second generation is intermediate spectrum and an example is cefotitan. Third generation are the ones you probably heard the most. These are considered broad spectrum antibiotics and include cefotaxime, ceftriaxone and cefixime. One thing to note is that ceftriaxone should not be given with calcium solutions as it can cause calcium precipitation in the lungs and the kidneys which may then be fatal. Fourth generation adds pseudomonas cover and an example is cefepime. Finally, fifth generation is very broad spectrum, the example being ceftaroline. Cephalosporins cover gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria but have more effect on one or the other depending on the generation used. Side effects include hypersensitivity and superinfections with enterococci, enterobacter or candida. Since there are so many, I'll have to talk about the indications on a different page. First generation covers things like methicillin sensitive Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Strep viridians and are used in upper respiratory tract infections as well as skin and soft tissue infections. Second generation covers the first gen agents as well as E. coli, Klebsiella, Neisseria meningitidis and beta lactamase positive H. influenza. These are used in community acquired pneumonia, sinusitis and skin and soft tissue infections. Third gen covers a lot, so all of the first generation but they also have more gram negative action. These are mostly used in community acquired pneumonia, bacterial meningitis, UTIs, anogenital gonorrhea, intra-abdominal or pelvic infections alongside metronidazole or clindamycin. Fourth generation has pseudomonas cover well, fifth generation is quite new and is effective against gram positive as well as being broad spectrum against gram negative. Then we have the carbapenems. Examples include doripenem, imipenem and miropenem. These also inhibit cell wall synthesis but are mostly used as last line agents because they have the ability to inhibit beta lactamase, the enzyme present in some bacteria that make them resistant to other beta lactam antibiotics including penicillin and cephalosporins. Carbapenems cover gram-positive, gram-negative and anaerobic bacteria 
but they do not cover MRSA. Side effects include GI distress, rash, allergies, and seizures in patients with renal dysfunction. Indications include UTIs, meningitis, sepsis, bone or intra-abdominal and pelvic infections, among other conditions like ventilator-associated pneumonia and complicated skin infections. Penicillin's next, probably the most famous group of antibiotics. These include amoxicillin, which is nowadays one of the most common ones used, as well as flucloxacillin and piperacillin. These can often be combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, such as clavulanic acid or tazobactam. Examples of these combinations include coamoxiclav and piptazin. Penicillins work by inhibiting cell wall synthesis, specifically by inhibiting enzymes that are necessary for the cross-linking of peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Penicillins generally cover gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. General side effects include hypersensitivity, which can occasionally be anaphylactic and fatal. Additionally, there can be neurotoxicity and seizures, especially when there are intrathecal injections performed. Indications include endocarditis, skin and soft tissue infections, pneumonia or upper respiratory tract infections, as well as neurosyphilis, just to name a few. Next on our list, we have the tetracyclines. Examples include tetracycline itself and doxycycline. This class of antibiotics inhibit protein synthesis in the bacteria, once again by binding to the 30S ribosomal subunit. Tetracyclines also have coverage of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, but generally are not used so much for strep or staph infections. Side effects include GI, renal, and reversible liver toxicity, as well as the staining of teeth and retardation of fetal bone growth. This is the reason why they are contraindicated in pregnant women and children under 8 years of age. Indications include anthrax, clostridium tetani, and atypical community-acquired pneumonia. Quinolones, specifically fluoroquinolones, were next, and examples include ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin. The mechanism of action is through DNA inhibition. They interfere with the activity of DNA gyrases, specifically top isomerase 2 and 4. These enzymes are responsible for causing DNA to rewind following replication. This class of antibiotics also cover both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, but the so-called respiratory fluoroquinolones have enhanced action against gram-positive bacteria and atypical pneumonia agents such as chlamydia, mycoplasma and legionella. Side effects include cartilage toxicity and an increased risk of tendon rupture, particularly in the Achilles tendon. There's also a risk of irreversible peripheral neuropathy, as well as pseudomembranous colitis due to overgrowth of C. diff. General indications include atypical pneumonia for the respiratory fluoroquinolones, as well as UTI, gastroenteritis, and osteomyelitis for ciprofloxacin. Macrolides were next. These include clarithromycin, erythromycin, and azithromycin. These inhibit protein synthesis too, but instead they bind the 50S ribosomal subunit and block the polypeptide exit tunnel rather than the 30S subunit. Generally, macrolides are more effective on gram-positive than gram-negative due to their larger size and inability to penetrate both membranes in gram-negative bacteria. Side effects include mild GI upset, hypersensitivity, erythromycin in particular can give cholestatic jaundice and QT prolongation that may cause the torsat arrhythmia. Finally, the macrolides are cytochrome P450 inhibitors, apart from azithromycin. I'll leave a link to my mnemonic on the inhibitors and inducers in the top right corner. Indications for the macrolides with respiratory and sinus infections, as well as STIs such as chlamydia. Our second to last class is the sulfonamides. Examples include sulfamethexazole and trimethoprim, which are more commonly used together than as a single agent. They work by inhibiting folic acid production, which is required for nucleic acid formation. The combination of sulfamethexazole and trimethoprim works on gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, including MRSA. Side effects include hypersensitivity, which may lead to Steven Johnson syndrome, which has 20% mortality. Nephrotoxicity is another, as well as hyperkalemia, neutropenia, 
hemolytic anemia, and there's also risk of carnicterus in infants, which is why they are contraindicated in newborns and in the last two months of pregnancy. Indications include MRSA infections, cystitis due to E. coli, as well as listeriosis if the patient cannot take penicillin. Our final class of antibiotics is the glycopeptides, the best known example being vancomycin. Vancomycin offers MRSA coverage, but it's too big to get into the pores of gram-negative bacteria, so it does not work on gram-negative. Also, vancomycin can be used in patients allergic to beta-lactam antibiotics. Vancomycin works by binding to the D-alanine-D-alanine terminal of a growing peptide chain in cell wall synthesis, and thus it leads to transpeptidase inhibition. Side effects include nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity, but compared to aminoglycosides, these effects are rare. You may also get hypotension or red man syndrome, which is due to the flushing from histamine release if it is infused too quickly. Indications are MRSA, endocarditis due to streptoridians or enterococci, and pseudomembranous colitis due to C. diff. Okay, so let's move on to the more common infections. So for respiratory, we have exacerbations of chronic bronchitis, which is often caused by H. influenza, moroxella, and strep pneumo, for which we could use amoxicillin or clarithromycin. Uncomplicated community-acquired pneumonia, often caused by strep pneumo or haemophilus influenza, will usually use amoxicillin, but doxycycline or clarithromycin are recommended in penicillin-allergic patients. Flucloxacillin should be added if staphylococci are suspected. If we suspect pneumonia caused by atypical pathogens such as chlamydia or mycoplasma, we can use clarithromycin. Finally, in hospital-acquired pneumonia, we should cover pseudomonas, MRSA and Klebsiella, and so our options include comoxiclav or cefiroxime if we are within 5 days of admission. If we are later than 5 days, then either piperacillin and tazobactam, a broad-spec cephalosporin like ceftazidime, or a quinolone such as ciprofloxacin are options, as is vancomycin if it is necessary for MRSA. Next, we have urinary tract infections, most commonly caused by E. coli, but others include Klebsiella and Staphylococcus saprophyticus. An uncomplicated lower urinary tract infection is usually treated with sulfamethexazole and trimethoprim or nitrofurantoin, while in uncomplicated pyelonephritis, ciprofloxacin may also be used. Skin infections are next. Impetigo is primarily caused by strep pyogenes or staph aureus. This is treated with topical fusidic acid, oral flucloxacillin, or if it's widespread, erythromycin. Cellulitis is also commonly caused by strep pyogenes or staphylococcus aureus and is treated with flucloxacillin. But if the patient is allergic to penicillins, then clarithromycin, erythromycin, or doxycycline may be used. Erysipelas is caused by group A strep, once again mostly strep pyogenes, and can be treated using flucloxacillin, again with clarithromycin, erythromycin, or doxycycline if the patient is allergic to penicillins. Ear, nose, and throat infections are next on our list, and they are often caused by our friend strep pyogenes once again, and throat infections are generally treated by phenoxymethylpenicillin, or erythromycin alone, if they are allergic. Sinusitis is most commonly caused by strep pneumo, H. influenza, moroxella, and, once again, strep pyogenes, and can be treated by amoxicillin, doxycycline, or erythromycin. Next, we have otitis media, commonly caused by strep pneumo, H. influenza, or moroxella, and is treated by amoxicillin or erythromycin if they are allergic, while otitis externa is mostly due to pseudomonas, or staphylococcus aureus, and is treated mostly by flucloxacillin or erythromycin in the case of allergy, or you can even use ciprofloxacin. Okay, now for the gentle infections. Gonorrhea is treated with intramuscular ceftriaxone and oral azithromycin. Chlamydia is treated with doxycycline or azithromycin, while syphilis will require benzathine benzylpenicillin or doxycycline or erythromycin. 
Next, we have bacterial vaginosis that is treated with oral or topical metronidazole or topical clindamycin. Finally, PID or pelvic inflammatory disease can be treated with oral ofloxacin plus oral metronidazole or intramuscular ceftriaxone plus oral doxycycline and oral metronidazole. Okay, we're nearly there. Second to last are gastrointestinal infections. C. diff may be treated with metronidazole if it is mild and is the first episode, while more severe or later episodes will need vancomycin. Compilobacter enteritis is treated with clarithromycin, while non-typhoid salmonella and shigellosis can both be treated with ciprofloxacin. Finally, we have the central nervous system infections. If it's a bacterial meningitis, which is considered a medical emergency, the microbes we're likely to find depends on the mechanism or the patient's situation. But generally, we want to cover strep pneumo, Neisseria meningitis, Haemophilus influenza, and MRSA if likely. So we can use antibiotics like septriaxone, vancomycin, linezolid, ciprofloxacin, or miropenem.